Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Harm van Bakel. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Genetics and Genomic Sciences at Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, and I will be talking to you today about uh, the use of genomic technologies to understand the dynamics of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. And in particular, uh, I will show something about the dynamics of the epidemic uh, in New York City. So the work uh, that I will uh, highlight today would not have been possible um, without the pathogen surveillance uh, program in the Mount Sinai Health System. So this is a program that we established in uh, 2014. And the goal of this program is really to do very broad surveillance of positive clinical uh, specimens within our health system uh, and to look at DNA sequencing of those specimens and to perform whole genome analysis to track nosocomial infections and to understand better the spread and evolution of uh, pathogens in the New York City region. Um, to date, we have uh, collected roughly 100,000 specimens from the eight different hospitals in our system, and these include about 25,000 nasopharyngeal swabs from viral infections as well. Um, we, of course, combine all of this information with uh, detailed reports from the electronic medical record system uh, that are provided by the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory, uh, and these include patient demographics, visit information, outcome information, and allow us to combine the genomic sequencing data with very detailed epidemiological records. Um, to date, we have analyzed about 13,000 pathogen genomes. Um, initially, our focus was very much on uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus, so MRSA, uh, as well as Clostridium difficile. But in recent years, we have also focused on influenza A and influenza B infections within our health system, uh, and of course, more recently, SARS-CoV-2 um, in particular as well. Um, just to give some background information about our health system, so the system consists of eight different hospitals. Uh, with almost 4,000 beds in total, but also 400 uh, ambulatory sites. And between um, those hospitals and ambulatory sites, uh, we cover about 4 million patient visits, uh, and we cover a very broad area of New York City, including all of the major boroughs of the main metropolitan area. There's about 15,000 uh, inpatient admissions per year as well. Um, and of course, all the work that we uh, that we started in, in doing our pathogen surveillance program uh, radically changed when the first cases of SARS-CoV-2 were detected in New York City, and these were actually detected within our health system. So the first case was identified on February 29th, uh, which we dubbed New York One, um, and the second case was then identified on March 1st, which we dubbed New York Two. And both of these uh, initial cases we sequenced within uh, about two weeks. Uh, and deposited their data, the first genomic data from New York State, um, in the GIS-A database. And this is a large public database uh, that is used by labs all around the world to uh, essentially deposit genomic data from the cases that they have seen in their uh, respective health systems. Uh, and this is a very useful repository because we can use it to uh, identify our cases and place them in a more uh, global um, phylogenetic background. So this is exactly what we did for the first two cases. So on the left here, I'm showing a phylogenetic tree uh, that shows the position of the New York one, so the first uh, patient isolate that we sequenced. Um, this was an individual with a known travel history to the Middle East, and when we look at this phylogenetic tree, we can see that this uh, particular case indeed clustered in this tree uh, with other specimens uh, from patients with travel histories to the Middle East. On the right, we can see the same thing for the New York 2 uh, case, which clustered in the tree together with other cases from Spain. So essentially, all the groupings in this tree, all the branches of this tree, uh, denote uh, highly related cases of specimens. And we can use that to track and to position um, sequences that we saw here in the city and contrast them with other areas in the world. So these two first cases really gave us uh, an excellent opportunity to, to sort of set up and trial our um, sequencing and assembly pipelines. And the workflow that we established uh, is shown in this slide over here, where uh, our workflow essentially starts with RNA uh, from specimens testing positive for SARS-CoV-2. And then we have a variety of sequencing technologies, including Illumina, BacBio, Ion Torrent, and MinION that we deploy based on needs. So some of these technologies give us rapid throughput. 
uh, and quick turnaround times, uh, other technologies maybe take a little bit longer to do high throughput sequencing. Uh, so we deploy these tools as needed, um, and they give us either consensus genomes, which we can, as I indicated earlier, place in a larger phylogeny so that we can uh, study them in relation to the global background. Um, we can also call mutations and variants in the consensus sequence and identify novel variants of interest. Uh, or we can do intra-host analysis to see whether there are maybe minor variants present within the host uh, that do not dominate in the final consensus sequence. So to date, we have sequenced more than 5,000 SARS-CoV-2 genomes, of which more than 2,500 um, in New York City alone. So with, with these pipelines, we were essentially off to the races. Um, so what I'm showing here is the distribution of SARS-CoV-2 positive tests that we have uh, encountered in our health system. So there is the big major um, early pandemic peak that we saw in uh, middle of March and early April of 2020 last year. Then uh, the rates uh, went down and, and were actually quite low during the summer of last year. And then we saw an increase in rates again towards the end of summer and the beginning of fall. And this continues throughout uh, the winter of last year. Um, what is also very interesting here is that I juxtaposed the SARS-CoV-2 positive rates um, with those of influenza A and influenza B, and you can really see the big difference um, that we had in the number of SARS-CoV-2 cases uh, and the influenza cases of the, the final flu season. And what was particularly remarkable is that within a period of three weeks, we have roughly the same number of SARS-CoV-2 cases as we had seen of um, influenza throughout the six-month um, um, uh, seasonal influenza period between November uh, of 2019 and April of 2020. Um, <clears throat> so the, the initial uh, interest that we had in these cases was to look at these very early cases um, in the initial pandemic peak. So we, we knew that there was a very high influx of novel cases in New York City, but we didn't know where these cases actually originated from. So what we did is essentially uh, expand bef beyond the first two cases that we had sequenced and do an analysis of, of the first uh, 84 cases that we encountered in our health system. So we then did a very similar analysis to the first two cases that I, that I showed earlier. And what that essentially told us is that most of the initial cases that we saw in our city uh, originated from Europe. Uh, approximately 80% of the isolates that we had sequenced were very similar to cases that, um, that uh, were also sequenced in Europe during that time. And what that told us is that most of the initial introductions of the virus in New York City um, were related to travelers between Europe and New York. So this could be uh, tourists visiting New York, but also returning travelers uh, that return to home. Um, in addition to the introductions from Europe, we also saw um, a small number of domestic introductions. So that was mostly related to the initial cases that were detected in the US here within Washington. Uh, and we also saw uh, sporadic cases linked to the Middle East and Asia. But the really dominant introductions really uh, originated in Europe. Um, the other striking observation is that we saw those cases all throughout the city, which meant that the introduction of the virus was um, equivalent uh, in all of the different boroughs in the city as well. So although this told us something about where the virus originated from uh, that came from New York City. It didn't really tell us much about when the virus was introduced into the city. So based on the phylogenetic tree and based on the uh, time uh, timed analysis of these phylogenetic trees, we can make a rough inference to when the virus first arrived to the city. And we can do this by looking at the mutation rate of the virus and looking for the time to the last common ancestor to the dominant isolate that we saw here in New York City. Uh, and what that told us is that the most likely introduction was somewhere between late January and mid-February. But that time window was still fairly broad. Uh, and the reason why it is broad is because the mutation rate of SARS-CoV-2 is fairly low. So it's on average about two mutations um, every month. And that means that our inferences are limited to uh, a two to four week um, period of time. Um, luckily, one of our collaborators, uh, Mia Cerdillo from the Clinical Microlab here at Mount Sinai Hospital, um, had the foresight uh, to start accumulating two interesting sets of samples 
uh, beginning in early January of 2020. Uh, OneSent was uh, a series of 3,000 banked respiratory pathogen negative specimens. So these were essentially specimens from individuals that sought care in our health system, um, but that tested uh, negative for known respiratory virus infection. So these were people with respiratory disease symptoms, but not tested negative for, for example, influenza during that period of time. Uh, and by essentially taking another look at the series of samples and now screening for the presence of SARS-CoV-2, it could tell us something about molecular evidence of SARS-CoV-2 um, RNA within the city. The second set of samples was a series of more than 10,000 plasma samples that were taken from Mount Sinai Hospital patients. Um, and these samples were divided into two different subsets. So we had one set of urgent care samples. So these were uh, plasma samples taken from people that visited, for example, emergency departments and that sought acute care. And these were likely enriched for um, acute SARS-CoV-2 infections, in particular during um, the early pandemic peak, which was uh, during which time the, the regular care was, uh, was reduced quite considerably. Um, we also had a second uh, group of patients, so these were in the routine care group. Uh, these were people coming in for follow-up appointments, for, for example, prenatal testing, um, and these more uh, closely represented the general population. And these two sample sets were roughly 50-50 uh, distributed. So I'll show you some of the results of the cross-sectional analysis first. Um, so the two plots that I'm showing here on the left are the results for the urgent care group, and these were essentially um, our positive controls for this analysis. And then on the right uh, are the same results but now for the routine care group. So what we see for the urgent care group is that um, consistent with the early pandemic peak, so the early surge of the virus uh, in late March and then the beginning of April, we see that uh, very closely reflected within the zero positivity um, of our panel with an offset of about two weeks, which is the time that it takes for, um, for antibody responses to become, uh, to become detectable. Um, what we then see is that during the summer months, uh, when we saw very few acute cases, uh, we see this frequency reduced to about 20 to 25 percent. Um, at the same time, we also see a similar increase in the routine care group uh, uh, this is a more gradual increase until about mid-April, at which point um, the, the frequency levels off to about 20%, which is very similar to what we saw during the summer months for the urgent care group as well. So what these data tell us are two things. First is that during the first pandemic peak, uh, about one in five New Yorkers were exposed uh, to the virus. Uh, what it also tells us, if we look at the early period um, between February and, uh, and mid-March, is that there was between 2%, um, uh, up to 2% of cases uh, had already evidence of prior infections with COVID-19. So we don't know whether these individuals were uh, exposed while they were in New York uh, or whether they were exposed uh, prior to, for example, travel to New York, but it does tell us that there was already detectable seroconverted individuals within the city uh, during the month of uh, February. So, of course, we wanted to back this up with molecular evidence uh, to see whether we could detect the presence of virus uh, within uh, the same patient populations. And for this, we used the second set of samples. So these were the 3,000 samples uh, of individuals that tested negative for no respiratory virus pathogens, and that we then pooled in sets of 10 and rescreened uh, on the Roche-Cobalt system um, to do an RTQ-PCR for SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, vital RNA. So this particular test has two different probes, uh, T1 and T2, uh, each of which target a different region of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. And we essentially identified positive uh, samples that had detection of both of those uh, targets, as well as presumptive positive uh, pools that had detection of at least one of those targets. Uh, and we followed up both types of samples. So the results of that are shown here. So um, between January and March, uh, we tested consecutive weeks, uh, and the numbers here indicate the total numbers of pools tested. Um, and at the top of each bar, as we can see, how many presumptive positive and how many positive samples were detected. Uh, 
um, we can look at that in a little bit more detail. So just highlighting the presumptive positive and the positive specimens, we can see that the earliest detections were as early as the uh, week ending in January 18th and January 25th. Um, but the bulk of detections really come at the end of February uh, and at the beginning of March. We then did additional sequencing of those samples because, of course, we wanted A, to validate um, that these samples indeed had viral RNA present, viral genomic RNA present, but we also wanted to see if we could reconstruct the genomes and add them to the phylogenies of these initial cases that we had already profiled. Um, and the results of the sequencing are shown here. So we had es essentially uh, several of the initial samples confirmed uh, from the week ending in January 25th as well as the week uh, ending in February 1st. So all of those samples, we were not able to obtain complete genomes, but we did detect the presence of viral RNA, which validates that we indeed had detection of SARS-CoV-2 vital RNA um, during this period of time. And then in the later sample sets from uh, the weeks ending on February 29th, as well as the week ending on March 7th, uh, we were able to obtain complete genomes. So we then took those genomes uh, and placed them within the larger phylogenetic tree of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and what that showed us is that in addition to these early detections that we saw in the week ending of January 25th and the week ending on February 1st, that we were not able to place in the tree because we did not obtain a complete genome, uh, we do see the, in red here, the different dots in red, uh, the complete genomes that we obtained prior to the surge of cases that are highlighted here in yellow uh, that occurred mostly in March, uh, mid-March to end of March of uh, 2020. Um, and what that tells us is that we have the earliest detection in the week of January 25th, but also that we had multiple detections between our sort of initial positive cases that were identified based on known travel history and the surge of cases that we saw in uh, mid-March once the detection uh, capability, so our ability to detect SARS-CoV-2 at, uh, at higher numbers uh, actually came online. So we had a brief window of time of maybe about two weeks that if we had uh, widespread testing uh, online earlier, we could have um, detected community spread um, uh, prior to the large surge that we saw um, in the weeks uh, preceding. So of course, we have not sit still um, since the initial detection of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we have continued our surveillance in the New York area. Uh, we have done this now for, uh, for over a year, and we're sequencing at a, at a weekly frequency, uh, covering approximately 10% of, um, of positive specimens that are detected in the Mount Sinai healthcare system. Um, and what this has told us, essentially, is that while uh, our initial detections were very homogeneous, so we saw most of the initial introductions uh, related to European travelers, um, uh, predominantly made up of uh, the, the one branch of the tree, which is the 20C clade, um, but the current picture is much more diverse. We see much more diversity, and we see really a broad representation of um, different lineages that are circulating globally. Uh, and we are encountering all of the different lineages here in New York City, which is not surprising considering that we are a major travel hub and that we have uh, very broad connections with many parts of the world. Uh, and it's also consistent with the opening up, uh, gradual opening up of the city um, since late summer and until um, uh, the winter uh, season. So the hardware landscape in, in the city has not only been shaped by these various introductions that I already highlighted, um, what we also see is that local spread has contributed significantly to the landscape here. And one nice example of this is the B.1.1.304 uh, uh, lineage, which is one of the branches in the tree uh, of SARS-CoV-2, which I've shown here at the top. Um, we first see this lineage uh, emerge in the fall of 2020, um, and then we sort of see it uh, gradually increase over time and to become the dominant strain that we observed here in our healthcare uh, patients um, during late summer and early fall. Um, what uh, we did is not only track this in time, so we not only can see this uh, emergence of the strain and track it over time, we can also track it over space, which is what we have done here. Um, and what we can see is essentially that uh, while this lineage started very locally, so it started in one area of Brooklyn, 
Um, if we track it over time, we can see that it begins to slowly expand, uh, first locally, but then also uh, throughout other boroughs of the city. And this is, I think, a, a really nice example of a super spreader event um, that then later uh, can seed multiple cases uh, throughout a, a wider region um, as well. Um, more recently, we have become increasingly interested in tracking variants. So these are um, uh, variants of SARS-CoV-2 that carry mutations uh, in the receptor binding domain, but also other regions of the virus. Um, the receptor binding domain is, of course, very important because of the area of the spike protein, uh, which is the vital receptor that um, uh, the virus uses to uh, gain entry into host cells. And the RBD, the receptor binding domain, is responsible for interactions with the ACE2 uh, host cell receptor. Um, and this interaction is, is key to gaining entry into host cells. Um, what we've seen now uh, emerge over the last several months is an increased number of mutations in this domain. And these mutations could, for example, impact the interaction with the host receptor, but they could also impact interactions with antibodies um, uh, that could neutralize this interaction. Uh, and of course, this could lead the virus to, uh, to have reduced uh, susceptibility to, for example, vaccination or previous immunity. I should note, though, that um, during vaccination, people are, uh, are inoculated with the entire spike protein. So that also indu induces lots of antibodies that target other regions of the spike protein. Uh, and there is currently uh, no evidence uh, or currently that the vaccines remain broad broadly protective even against these new viral variants. Um, so for the last part of my presentation, uh, I wanted to highlight also some of the work that we have been doing to track um, transmissions and outbreaks uh, of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and we have done this using tools uh, that we have developed for this purpose. And in particular, uh, the one that I'm highlighting here is the Pathospot tool, which is something that we developed to, uh, to do whole genome alignments of viral genomes or bacterial genomes and then to use uh, genome similarity to identify clusters of highly related isolates and integrate the clusters of those isolates with uh, detailed epidemiological information of the patients that these isolates have been identified in uh, and to plot timelines um, of infection and to use those timelines to then uh, delineate the origins of particular outbreaks and transmissions. So we did this in early uh, 2019 for an influenza A outbreak uh, in one of the hospitals in our system. Um, and what we were able to uh, identify there is that uh, for a large outbreak uh, that impacted approximately 100 patients and healthcare providers, we were able to trace that outbreak to a single exposure event um, in the emergency department um, that impacted three patients and one healthcare worker. And when those patients and, and healthcare workers then uh, proceeded to, um, uh, to transfer to other areas in the hospital, they essentially brought the virus with them uh, and spread the outbreak among uh, larger um, uh, numbers of patients and healthcare workers. So I think this, this is a very nice illustration of how uh, whole genome sequencing can uh, precisely delineate who is part of an outbreak. And that is very important in tracking uh, some of these early, early events. So we were then able to, um, to use these tools um, in, in a variety of different settings. One of these is to study um, transmissions among marine recruits during uh, supervised quarantine. So obviously, um, early on in the pandemic, it became clear uh, for the military that they had to uh, in instantiate um, uh, quarantining procedures to uh, to reduce the risk of outbreaks in, in for example, training facilities uh, and to reduce impact on military readiness. Um, so the quarantine schedule that was devised for this um, at the Marine uh, Corps Recruiting Depot in Paris Island um, was to subject new recruits to uh, a two-week self-quarantine at home um, prior to them traveling to the recruit uh, depot and then follow this by testing on arrival and then do additional testing uh, in week one and week two after arrival during a supervised quarantine. Uh, so this was PCR testing, uh, which tests for the presence of viral RNA. Um, and then the crews were only allowed to enter in the base if they tested uh, negative after week two of surveillance. Um, 
So these, uh, we essentially followed for this cohort classes of 350 to 450 recruits that arrived uh, weekly, uh, and we looked at a total of nine classes. Um, there were no interactions between classes, so each of them should be uh, quite well separated. And then each of the classes during the supervised quarantine uh, was instructed to use masks, social distancing, to perform frequent hand uh, washing. And each of the participants um, in our study was housed uh, with, a, with a single roommate. So basically all um, available public health measures were, uh, were taken to ensure um, that the risk of transmission was reduced as much as possible during the supervised quarantine. So in total there were approximately 1,800 study participants and these were drawn from recruits uh, that mostly uh, came from the East Coast um, as highlighted over here. Um, and then among the participants we saw that uh, 20 of them were positive uh, for SARS-CoV-2 on arrival for the supervised quarantine. Uh, and of those, the vast majority, 95%, were asymptomatic. Um, and this really highlights very clearly, especially in young adult cohorts, the need for widespread testing, as many of the cases will um, will elude detection during, uh, during due to asymptomatic uh, carriage. Um, then in the subsequent weeks, so these, the, the first 20 participants were identified on arrival. In the subsequent two weeks, uh, we identified another 31 participants that tested positive. Um, during their quarantine period, and these can either be specimens that were missed on the initial screening, or they can um, signify transmission during the two-week quarantine. Um, of these uh, 51 cases, uh, we identified genomes, or we obtained genomes for about 32 participants, which is about 63% of, um, of the positive specimens. We then took those uh, complete genomes and we placed them within the larger phylogeny of SARS-CoV-2 uh, at the time. So basically on the left, there is the, the phylogenetic tree that gives an overview of the global diversity of SARS-CoV-2 with the different lineages that were circulating um, at the time of the study. And then you can see with the different uh, uh, circles, the different colored circles within the tree, um, that the, the, the positive specimens that we identified among the study participants um, broadly clustered uh, throughout this tree. And that's very um, 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 consistent with the broad catchment area of the East Coast that uh, study participants were drawn from. What is also very striking is that uh, within this larger uh, background diversity, we did have an identify multiple clusters of specimens that were highly related to each other, and that suggests to us that, um, that these were part of transmissions and outbreaks during the quarantine period. Um, I've highlighted two clusters among those, so cluster two and cluster five, which were two of the largest clusters we identified during the study period. Um, and if we look at those in, in more detail and map them actually to the room layout uh, that these were housed in, we can actually see that those two clusters um, were identified among two different platoons, so platoon F and platoon E, that were housed together on the same floor um, of the quarantine um, building. Um, and they shared, uh, within each platoon, um, participants shared uh, rooms in pairs. Uh, and what is interesting to note is that both clusters were contained within platoons. Um, and that there was no sharing of individuals between platoons except for um, two cases where one individual from each platoon were housed in the same uh, were housed in the same room. So the other takeaway is that most of the young adult cases here were asymptomatic, and that again highlights that asymptomatic um, spread is very important is a very important factor in uh, in young adult um, settings, and that widespread testing is is really needed to identify those cases. Um, the other general take home here is that shared accommodation and sort of long term shared rooms uh, are really important factor in transmission as well. So we have now taken some of those lessons and have applied them uh, in our health system as well. Um, so we've used similar approaches to uh, investigate multiple suspected nosocomial events uh, starting in August, in August of 2020. Um, we have identified multiple um, uh, nosocomial clusters and, and have been able to use genomic uh, analysis to precisely delineate who was part and who was not part of these clusters. Uh, and again, similar to the outbreak that we uh, had investigated in early 2019, 
it allows us to identify potential exposure events uh, that precipitated some of these larger outbreaks. With that, uh, I'll come to my conclusion. So with the data that I've shown today, um, there really is evidence for many multiple introductions uh, into the New York City metropolitan area. Um, initial introductions were as early as the end of January, although we do not think that these in initial introductions uh, uh, resulted in forward spread based on the fact that we only saw um, a larger pandemic peak uh, towards the middle of May. Um, so the early transmission events that we uh, identified and the early communities that we identified mostly track back to cases that were uh, identified in Europe and that indicates that travelers from Europe were responsible for most of the initial spread of SARS-CoV-2 in New York City. Um, but over time, these patterns have changed quite considerably. Uh, and we think that these reflect patterns in the difference, uh, differences in the patterns of international um, domestic and local introductions that also came with the opening up of the city, uh, as well as um, uh, continued community spread uh, that have shaped the viral landscape in the city. Um, we continue to track closely the emergence of new mutations and variants of concern, which really requires a continuous monitoring by genomic surveillance. And we see in particular, for example, the UK variant um, and the B1.526 variant that have really gained prominence in New York City. Um, in the earlier months of, uh, of 2021. Um, and finally, by uh, doing outbreak analysis, we have also shown that widespread testing is key to track asymptomatic transmissions, and that is in particular uh, of importance in, in young adult group settings. Um, and the similar tools can also be uh, highly useful for precision surveillance in, uh, in nosocomial settings. And with that, I just want to acknowledge a large number of, um, of people that have contributed to this work. Of course, this was a, a major group effort um, that involved not only my lab, uh, but also Viviana Simon's lab, uh, the clinical microbiology uh, team at, uh, Mount Sinai, uh, at the Mount Sinai Health System, uh, and in particular, Emilia Sordillo, um, Florian, Florian Kramer's lab that was responsible for a lot of the serology testing. And then finally, the work uh, that I showed on the, um, the marine recruitment cohort was done in collaboration with the Silphone Lab, uh, as well as the Naval Medical Research Center. And with that, uh, I will end my presentation.